Good day, everyone. I'm your host for today's webinar. My name is Mike Lasecki. Today, our topic is give your proposal a competitive edge with a great evaluation plan. Thank you for joining today. Please use the chat window to respond to questions we have for you and to ask questions of our expert presenter. You see the chat window in the upper right of your screen. This webinar is brought to you by ATE Central. They're the information hub for the ATE community. You can find out much more about their services and all of the resources they have at atecentral.net. Evaluate. This webinar is brought to you by Evaluate, the Evaluation Support Center for the Advanced Technological Education Program. Evaluate serves the ATE community and others by holding webinars like this one on evaluation and maintaining an open access resource library. They also curate a blog about STEM education evaluation and they collect and disseminate data about the ATE program. Be sure to check out the Evaluate website. You see it right there at the bottom of your screen, evalu-8.org. The materials for this webinar well, the slides are already available on the website and you can access them on the right hand side of your screen by downloading them. Also, the checklist is on the website and on the right hand side of your screen, plus several other resources to help you with developing your ATE proposals evaluation plan. The checklist can be accessed either from the screen or going to the website, following the link to resources any way you want to you can get these resources for today. And by the way, the recording to this webinar will be available within a couple of days and that will automatically be emailed to you. As I mentioned, I'm Mike Lasecki. I work with Luca Partners. I, it's my privilege to collaborate with Western M Michigan University and Evaluate. I'll be the moderator for the webinar today and I also serve on Evaluate's Community College Liaison Panel. Lori Wingate is the main presenter for the webinar. She's the director of Evaluate, which is located at the Evaluation Center at Western Michigan University. Now behind the scenes, we'd like to recognize our colleagues who have worked to help bring this webinar to you today. This includes Emma Perk and Lisa Becho from Evaluate, Cynthia Williams, she's Evaluate's editor from Style Sheets, and working with me, Janet Penhorn and Shannon Payne, behind the scenes at Luca Partners. I'd like to acknowledge the support of the National Science Foundation, but let me remind you that any opinions and findings and conclusions or recommendations you might hear today are those of the presenters and do not necessarily reflect the views of the National Science Foundation. Thank you, NSF. Now it's time for me to turn over the webinar to Lori Wingate. Go ahead, Lori. Well, thank you, Mike, and welcome, everybody. So I want to let you know this webinar has two main sections. It's an hour long. So first, we're going to go over the essential elements of an ATE proposal evaluation plan and how to put your plan together in your proposal. And we're going to have several brief question breaks throughout this first part to make sure we address all your questions, because we're going to be covering a lot of material. And then we'll review other places in your proposal where evaluation should show up, like in your budget and your data management plan and other spots. After we work through that content, we'll have a final question break to make sure all your questions have been addressed. We're going to cover a lot of ground in a short amount of time, and Mike has mentioned this checklist. So our ATE evaluation plan checklist is going to help you remember what we go over today and help you apply the concepts to your own proposals. The checklist has key points on everything we're going to review today and includes links to a lot of additional resources, which I'll also highlight throughout the webinar. Mike's mentioned a couple of times now, you can download the checklist now by uh, clicking on there's under files there's a checklist as well as the slides you can also get to those and that material as well as everything else all the other resource materials I'll mention today by clicking on the web link that says resources and that will take you to the page about this webinar that has all the materials um, that I'm going to reference today um, so 
I also want to point out this checklist, the version I'm highlighting today, is based on a previous version. So it's been an updated and streamlined. And we are inviting members of the ATE community to actually field test it as they develop their evaluation plans and provide us with field, field um, uh, feedback on how it influenced the development of their plans. And there's information about that when you go to you follow the link um, on our website for the checklist. Uh, anytime you see a slide like this with a border on it, it means you're going to be asked to do something. So we don't want you to just sit and listen today. We want you to participate. This time we're going to have a couple polls for you that are going to appear in the screen. I'm going to ask which one, um, which thing best describes you. Are you a principal investigator, a project leader, a grant writer, and so forth? And then are you involved in the ATE program? And in what way? So we'll see those results as they come in. Seeing a lot of evaluators and grant writers, which is great. You need to have those folks involved early in the proposal development process. Okay, and as far as involvement in the ATE program, we have a fair split between those involved, uh, those submitting proposals, and those already funded. And um, I see several of you aren't involved in the ATE program, and that is perfectly fine. This is uh, NSF's Advanced Technological Education Program, but a lot of the elements we're going to review today are going to transfer to very many different contexts with regard to evaluation. I'd like to point out for those of you who already may know quite a lot about evaluation, um, some of the information we're going to cover early in the webinar may be kind of old news for you, but I hope you'll hang on with us because we do have some good stuff for you later in the webinar. All right, so thanks for doing that poll, and you know how to do a poll. So um, just to give you a little background on what ATE is, it is a program um, from the National Science Foundation that's focused on improving technician education, and that's done mainly by funding two-year colleges. So it funds projects in the areas like advanced manufacturing, engineering technologies, IT, nanotechnologies, and so on. We're going to actually use a specific uh, project example to go some over today's um, content. So the example project is seeking to improve a two-year college's aviation technology program, and that's in order to attract and retain more students and address the regional demand for skilled workers in this field. So this project has three main components. They're planning to develop and offer an aviation summer grant uh, summer camp, sorry, for grades 6 through 12, and develop an intro to aviation course that will also serve as a gen ed requirement at this college, and create a new course specifically for students in the aviation program that focuses on the math they'll need in more advanced classes. So we're going to come back to this project a little later in the webinar. But now we'll dig into those essential elements of an ATE proposal evaluation plan. So nearly all types of NSF proposals are limited to 15 pages. So these little page thumbnails, which of course you are not expected to read, are actually images of our most recent funding proposal to NSF. And what we did for this proposal, and what I would recommend for all ATE proposals, and NSF in general really, is to dedicate one to two pages for evalu to evaluation. So the rule of thumb for budgeting for evaluation, and we'll talk about more, more about that later, is to spend 10% of your project budget on evaluation. And I like to follow that same rule of thumb uh, for the proportion of the project description that should go to evaluation, as I've shown here. In these few pages, you should identify who's going to evaluate your project, identify what the evaluation questions will be, Describe how you will collect data to address those evaluation questions, as well as how you plan to make sense of those data through analysis and interpretation. You'll want to know how the information from the evaluation will be communicated and how the project will use that information. And you'll also need to convey a timeline for the evaluation. So first off, the evaluator. NSF likes to see a specific evaluator who's committed to working on the project to be named in the proposal. So you want to do that first if you're able. 
Then briefly describe the evaluator's qualifications, especially their expertise and experience in STEM education project evaluation. And refer to the evaluator's biosketch and letter of collaboration, and those documents should be uploaded with the proposal as supplementary documents in NSF's proposal submission system. So the ATE program solicitation, which is the description of the program and, and the um, proposal submission requirements, it states that the funds to support an evaluator independent of the project must be requested. To this business of grants and evaluation, this may raise a couple of questions for you. So first of all, what do they really mean by an evaluator and what do they really mean by independent? So first of all, evaluators are professionals and their job is to investigate a project's quality and impact based on evidence. Now there isn't a specific degree or certification that allows a person to work as an evaluator. So it's really on the client to pick someone who's qualified and who they can work well with. So for an ATE project, you want an evaluator who has experience evaluating STEM education projects, who have strong research skills, both quantitative and qualitative, strong communication skills and a real service orientation, and an understanding of the NSF and two-year college contexts. Okay, so what makes an evaluator sufficiently independent to serve as the evaluator on an ATE project? We get this question a lot. So here we have our project. So someone working on the project, like a PI or co-PI or project manager, or even a participating faculty member would not be considered independent. So you, this person would not be independent. And that little ease for evaluator, by the way. That project sits in a department, typically in a college, and the same goes for someone outside of the project who works in the same department. There just isn't enough independence here. The department sits in a college, and according to the ATE program solicitation, the evaluator may be employed by the project's home institution as long as they work in a separate unit like a different academic program or an institutional research office. And outside of that, an evaluator out here really has the highest degree of independence unless that person has another role on the project. So you want to be um, careful about that. Now, another question a lot of people have uh, who are new to this is how do you find an evaluator? Um, there's a few places, things you can do. So the American Evaluation Association has a national directory of evaluators, and it's really nice to use because it's searchable by keyword um, and region. So if you want somebody close by, you can search by region. If you want somebody with a particular area of expertise, you can put that keyword in. With our colleagues at ATE Central, we maintain a map of evaluators who have evaluated ATE projects, and you can access that from the ATE Central website, which is on our checklist. And, and many universities maintain centers or have faculty who are involved in evaluation work, and so you can check those if there's some in your area. And your best bet, and it's always a good idea, is to check with colleagues. You know, ask them if they've been involved in an evaluation and they work with somebody um, that they would recommend. Okay, just to jog your memory, these are the three things you need to do in your proposal when it comes to identifying your evaluator or an evaluator. Identify them by name, describe their qualifications, and refer to their bio sketch and letter of collaboration. So keeping these things in mind, um, I'm going to present you with three examples of descriptions of evaluators that might appear in a project description as part of a proposal. And I'm going to ask you to think about, or to answer actually, which one you think is the best. Um, and we're going to use the, I'll give you just a second or you know, a few seconds uh, to read through, through these and then the poll will appear. So we've got three examples um, of how an evaluator might be described in a proposal. I'm just going to be quiet for a little bit and then the poll will come up and you can register your answer. Mike, maybe you can go ahead and show the poll for those who've already finished. Oh, 
and those will come back in just a minute, so don't worry if you didn't finish reading. Laurie, I've got a little problem with the alignment here. Um, you know, you can see that we're currently not on that ABC page again, so maybe people can just make their votes. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how to correct this alignment at this point, but I can go back to the questions if you want to. You can see most um, yeah, of us I'll are heading towards note, A. Yeah. Um, uh, that most people have selected A, so let's go ahead and go back to those examples. Sorry about that. Yeah, ideally we would have had that poll right there so you, you wouldn't have to uh, lose the text, but that's okay, we can work through these. Um, so those who had had a chance to answer and, and finish the reading and answer did select Proposal A as the best, and you're spot on with that. This is a good description, hits on all the points we discussed, and as you can see, it really doesn't take up a lot of space. You don't need to have a mini Vita embedded in your project description, just hit those highlights. Who is it? Where do they work? What's their credentials and what's their experience with um, STEM education evaluation? With the middle example, it's not awful, right? But it's not really clear who will be doing the evaluation. And more importantly, it's not clear if this age center has actually committed to the work on the project. I've actually had the experience where our um, evaluation center was written into a proposal and we had no idea that happened. You don't want to do that. You want to get those commitments up front and communicate that to the reviewers. In proposal C, you know, this person might actually just be fine, but uh, they haven't communicated that person's experience leading external evaluation. So that would be um, an important um, aspect of their qualifications that you'd want to communicate. Okay, well, thank you for doing that. To help you with this task of finding and selecting an evaluator, we have this little guide to finding and selecting an evaluator for ATE proposals. And it walks through the process of identifying an evaluator for the project by answering common questions that we've gotten about this topic. And it includes links to some of the, the resources that I mentioned, like the evaluator maps and directories. And as I mentioned, um, in this part, the proposal should include the evaluator's bio sketch in NSF format. And NSF has a very strict format for this. So we've created a template to help with that um, because an evaluator would want to highlight different things than, than a principal investigator, which is really what their bio sketch for, um, format is set up for. Now, before we move on to um, talking about evaluation questions uh, that you would present in your evaluation plan, um, we're going to have a quick question break to see if you have any questions about identifying an evaluator in a proposal. So, Mike, uh, do we have any questions on this? We do, Lori, and it has to do about really procurement policies at institutions. And one of our colleagues says, what do you do if you have to put out um, your evaluation for a bid, or what if your institution doesn't allow you to select an evaluator before the award is made? You know, what position are you in? What do you do? Right. Really good question, and it is a question we get a lot. And I'll just admit, there's no easy answer, and it is a frustrating situation. But we actually do have advice for that situation in our evaluation plan checklist, which is consistent with what the ATE program solicitation states. Basically, you want to clearly acknowledge in the proposal that you have this policy that's you know, preventing the, the proposers from identifying the evaluator at that point. Um, explain what the policy is. And then importantly, explain how the, the team, the project will uh, go about selecting an evaluator. So what is the process that when the award is made, they will um, pursue, how they will pursue an evaluator and determine how, whether who to work with, you know, and determine their qualifications. Um, I'll also just as a side note mention this is a topic we are going to be researching um, starting in 2019 with um, Mike involved because we're very interested in helping people solve this problem of this quandary is like NSF wants to see an evaluator named and yet they're not uh, an institution may not allow that. So, um, you know, a good grant writer often knows how to prepare a good evaluation plan. We have a lot of resources to guide people through that process um, to actually get a good plan in place, even if you're not working in a, with an evaluator at that point. Well, next in the evaluation plan, you need to identify the evaluator. 
So evaluation questions are the overarching questions about the project's quality, its impact, um, its effectiveness that the evaluation will answer based on evidence. So you want to uh, present a few evaluation questions that you're going to address, about three to seven questions. We're not talking like 20 or 30 questions here. And you want to be sure to include questions about both project implementation and outcomes. And it's really important that the evaluation questions are clearly aligned with the project's goals and activities as they're described in the proposal. Now, a good way to make sure you touch on all of these points uh, in your evaluation questions is by developing a project logic model that can serve for not only showing your design of your project, but also for evaluation planning. So a logic model is a way of visually communicating a project's activities and outcomes. They are not required for the ATE program, but they're still quite useful for showing, again, the overall project um, design and for evaluation planning. So here's just a few images of various logic models from the ATE program and other STEM education projects. And they come in various formats, but they're typically going to show the project's inputs, that is, the resources that it's using, their activities, the outputs or the products, and the outcomes. I'm going to walk through a logic model for our example project, but I'm going to keep it very simple and just include activities and outcomes. The activities in a logic model are about what the project does, what it creates, what it delivers. In contrast, the outcomes are the changes the project intends to bring about through those activities. I like to think of outcomes as the difference the project makes, whether for individuals or organizations, communities, society at large. These are typically framed in terms of what will happen in the short, mid, or long term. For our example project, in the activities column, I just put in those three main activities, offering the summer camp and develop developing the two different courses. The ultimate aim of these activities is to meet the regional demand for skilled workers uh, in the aviation industry. So that means in the long term, this project wants to see program graduates gain employment as aviation technicians or to transfer to aviation programs at four-year colleges. Now the reason that logic models are so helpful for evaluation planning is that they connect the dots between the project activities and the outcomes. So in this example, the project activities should lead to more students enrolling in the college's aviation program and more of those students to persist in that program. And that should lead to more graduates, which links up with the long-term outcomes. Now note that this is a three-year project, which is typical in ATE. So that long-term outcome is most likely going to happen after the grant expires, whereas the activities will begin immediately and the short and midterm outcomes should st start showing up in year two and later. We're going to go, we're going to be using this logic model to come up with some evaluation questions. Okay, so when it comes to the initial evaluation of project activities, I think it's always a good idea to really get a handle on who is participating and what their opinions of the activities are. You know, we could ask a bunch of questions here, but we want to keep it at a high level. So I'd suggesting, uh, I'd, I would ask what, to what extent the camp and the courses are achieving the project's targets in terms of the student numbers, diversity, and their satisfaction. Now we're going to going to get into setting those in this webinar, we're going to assume that the project has established those and we can use them for the evaluation. It would also be important to ask a general question about project strengths and weaknesses to make sure the evaluation is gathering information that can be used by the project for improvement as it's being implemented. Now, in terms of looking at the courses themselves, I would actually suggest convening an expert panel to provide feedback during development to make sure that the, the courses are meeting standards in terms of the, the academic um, needs as well as industry, the ind what industry wants these uh, courses to do for the, for the students going through the program. I would do that rather than making it a task for the evaluator. So I wouldn't actually propose a, a question for, 
for this part um, about course quality, though that's very important. Instead, I would embed the expert feedback into the development process. Now, with regard to the short-term outcomes, it's important to assess how well the project is progressing toward those longer range outcomes. So if things are not happening the way they were expected, then adjustments can be made to improve the results. So here I would ask about the project, if the project activities are enhancing or how they're impacting enrollment and persistence in the program. And this is information that can be captured right away to see if the activities are having an effect in the desired direction. At the next level, we'd want to look at graduation rates in terms of the number, the percentage, and the diversity of students completing the program. Diversity is important for all NSF uh, funded endeavors, um, and we'd want to know if that program is serving all types of students equal, equally well, or if some are, are falling through the cracks or being uh, not being served as well by the program. Now, as I noted earlier, this long-term outcome, these two outcomes, probably won't be realized within the three-year time frame. So we wouldn't necessarily focus an evaluation question at this level at this time, but it would be important to start collecting data on these desired outcomes for use down the road. So we have two questions about implementation, one question about short-term outcomes, and one about midterm outcomes. I should say short and midterm outcomes there, that's okay. Um, I would also want to find out from stakeholders what additional questions they might want to have answered and include those as well. Now, some of you may be wondering why we would bother with all of this and not just ask, did the project achieve its goals? And that's because goals sometimes focus on implementation or activities, and sometimes they focus on outcomes. Now, if a pro program's goals are stated around activities exclusively, then the evaluations, if the evaluation only focuses on goal achievement, then you're never going to get to outcome evaluation. It's, it's probably more helpful if I show you what I mean rather than tell you. So here's one way a goal could have been written for our project example. So offer an aviation summer camp for grades 6 through 12, serving at least 50 students per year. So there's going to be a poll that keeps this in mind because this might disappear when the poll comes up. Um, decide if you think this goal statement is about project implementation, so the process of doing the project, or outcomes, what happens as a result of the project. Let's go ahead and pull up the poll. Okay, yeah, a vast majority is selecting. That's right, because offering the camp, that's the doing of the project. Offering the camp is what the project is doing through its activities. Now, if the evaluation focused on this goal only, it would basically just have to confirm that the camp happened and how many students it served. And that's not, NSF is looking for something much bigger um, when it comes to, to evaluations funded through this program. So here's another example. Uh, expand the marketing, no, oh, sorry, I need to advance the slide. Expand the marketing of the college's aviation technology program. Decide if you think this is a, a goal about implementation or about outcomes. Okay, I see, I, we, I think we can go ahead and broadcast the results, Mike, if not everyone's seeing them. But basically we have about two-thirds um, selecting implementation and a third selecting outcomes. So expanding marketing is, again, the doing of the project. It's something in, that's being done in service of a larger aim. So it's an important activity, but it's not an activity that um, is the change itself, right? So an implementation is the doing and the outcome is the change. Let's look at one more before we move on. Increase the pool of graduates who are prepared for careers in aviation. Think about if that's outcome or implementation and then the poll will come up. Yeah. 
again, we have, um, oh no, that was the old one. So new results, we're seeing almost everybody so far selecting outcomes. And that's absolutely right. So this statement is really that main outcome that the project is trying to achieve. Okay, so I think that's good, and I think we can close the poll. So the point here isn't that it's bad to focus on evaluation on goals, right? Or that you should never evaluate at the activity level. That's not the point. My point is you want to make sure you have balance in your evaluation questions, so addressing both implementation and outcomes. And the danger of only focusing on goal achievement is when goals only uh, are framed around activities. So I hope that is clear through that little exercise. For more information about what makes good evaluation questions, uh, you can see the evaluation questions checklist, with, which has uh, explanations of criteria for good evaluation questions, as well it, um, it points out what you should have tried to avoid in your evaluation questions. And if you want to create a logic model um, for your ATE project in particular, we have a template uh, that's really tailored to developing logic models for ATE projects, so it includes question prompts and examples that are tailored to the ATE program. If you want to learn more how to integrate a logic model into a proposal, you can see the recording slides and handout from a webinar we did on this um, just a couple of years ago on that uh, very topic. So I do apologize for the technical issues we've had, we've been having. Hopefully my audio is coming through okay, um, and we can take your questions now. Laurie, thank you. It's Mike. How does my audio sound to you? Good right now. Thank you, and yours sounds good too. Here's a question for you. As you construct these evaluation plans, is it something you can do yourself, or do you really need that external evaluator to help you construct it? Is it can you do it yourself? That's the question. You can do it yourself, okay? It is preferable um, to have a, uh, an experienced evaluator on board early to help you, all right? But evaluate, what we do is we put out a lot of resources, and there's links to those in, in, our, um, in our checklist about what to do when you can't get that person on board. So we try to, as you can see in this webinar, we're really breaking it down so that it can be done by you know, a, a smart person who knows their project um, and, and knows about research, all right? So evaluation is different from research, but it has a lot of the same principles. So this can be done without an evaluator. We absolutely do recommend that if you can find someone to work with at the proposal stage that you do that, because it will be all the, much, all the more stronger of a plan for that person's involvement. Um, and we wel welcome your questions here at Evaluate. If you're trying to do this on your own and you're struggling, please email me and I will help you uh, work through it. Happy to do that. Thanks, Lori. Here's one last question for this section. Thinking about timeline, about when should you, let's suppose your, your proposal's due October 16th, let's suppose. At what point should I have contacted an external evaluator? How far in advance do you typically work? Um, so I would say at least a month in advance is a decent amount of time. Um, now is not too early. Now is a great time to contact somebody that you would send them your draft plans, maybe a draft logic model, your overall proposal, just whatever you can share at this point with the evaluator, and they will work back and forth with you to get a plan that's nicely tailored to your work. What you will get if you contact somebody very late in the game, like within a week or two, I shouldn't say you will get, you might get, is a very generic plan that could have appeared in any proposal. And it's easy for reviewers and NSF program offers to spot those and realize they weren't really they weren't really tailored to the project and that and that, that doesn't review well. So ideally, you know, about a month um, and a longer is always preferable because you just have more time to, to really hone it and get it just right. Good, good response. Go ahead and take us forward, Lori. Okay. The next element of the evaluation plan is about the data. So what information will be used, how it will be collected, 
analyzed, interpreted, and these are distinct activities. I put them together because you really can't talk about one of these without reference to the others. So in this part, you need to touch on what information will be used to answer the evaluation questions. So these are the indicators, how the information will be obtained, the data collection methods, and from what sources, how the quantitative and qualitative data will be summarized, so that's analysis, and how the findings will be used to answer the evaluation questions, so that's interpretation. Now these points really are worth spending some time clarifying. So again, indicators are the specific things you'll measure to answer the evaluation questions. Data collection is how the information will be obtained. So typical methods are going to include things like surveys and interviews, focus groups, um, obtaining existing student or program level data. Now analysis is the process of transforming that raw data into usable information. This would include things like um, identifying themes in qualitative data or with quantitative data, um, generating descriptive statistics like means or percentages or doing st significance testing. Now analysis is not the same as interpretation. Interpretation is what you do so you can actually answer the evaluation question. So the guy with this tape measure in this photo, he's measured the height of the water in the glass in inches, but now he needs to interpret his finding to determine if that glass is half full or half empty, okay? So interpretation is how you reach conclusions. Now you may be thinking this is a lot of information to include in just one little part of a one to two page evaluation plan, and you're absolutely right. Um, you probably won't have a lot of room to go in depth, but you do want to demonstrate that there is a concrete plan for collecting and using the evaluation data. So in that in mind, this time we're gonna use chat. So I'd like you to take a moment to read this short snippet of an evaluation plan from a proposal, and then use the chat box to share what you think about how well it described the plan for obtaining and using data in this evaluation. All right, seeing Lynn and Max saying, generic and ultra generic then vague Bernadette notes it's not specific enough um, Cody is saying description is fine but generic okay someone point out could be a good introductory paragraph right but it would need to go on into mo more detail uh, to global all right you're hitting on it vague generic uh, not specific has a lot of good words, right? It says it's going to be mixed methods and quantitative and qualitative. There's going to be measures of performance. It's going to be formative and summative. It's all packed in there. But it doesn't have anything specific or concrete. It's just, it's fluff. Like you said, it's generic. Um, you, you, this could be in any proposal, right? You don't know what it's really going to do in terms of uh, what it's going to do for the project. So this is definitely not the kind of thing you want to see in your proposals evaluation plan. Now what you might want to do is an efficient way of presenting the data elements of an evaluation plan is to put them in a table like this. So I don't want you to worry about reading the contents of this at, at this point. It, that's not the purpose of this. I just want to show you the format. So here we have the evaluation question that's being addressed, then the indicators. See we've got multiple the data sources and methods, how that information is going to be analyzed, and the plan for interpreting it. So as you might imagine, using this format really forces you to think carefully about the data you'll collect, how you'll get it, and how you'll use it. Really, the, just the process of doing this can strengthen your evaluation plan. Now, if you want to put your data elements into uh, a table like this, we've got guidance for you in our evaluation data matrix template. And again, it has definitions and examples for each component that are tailored to the ATE program. We're going to go ahead and have another quick question break here if we want to catch up on any questions. Lori, we do want to come up on a question. 
is there a rule of thumb for how many key evaluation questions you would have? Um, you know, you have your short, medium, long-term outcomes. Is there a rule of thumb? Like, do you have three key questions or 10? Well, there, there, I would say, in my opinion, there is a rule of thumb. There's no absolute rule, though. I mean, I generally would go for three to seven evaluation questions, um, certainly not more than 10. And if you're getting, like, you're starting to list all these things you want to know and you've got 15 or 20 questions, what you're probably listing are data points, like um, how many students enrolled, uh, what percentage of students are satisfied. So those would be smaller data points or indicators that probably should be rolled up into a higher level question, right? So you should be able to remember the questions, you should be able to repeat them to people and give a sense of the overall purpose of the evaluation. So it's not a list of every data point you'll gather. It's a, it provides a general sense of the, the what will be investigated in the evaluation. Um, you know, I would definitely say you absolutely have to have more than one because you want to focus again on not just implementation or um, outcomes, but both. So I would say a minimum is two, minimum is two, and I certainly wouldn't have more than ten, but ideally somewhere in the range of three to seven. Makes sense. Here's a good comment from one of our participants. Would you go out to your stakeholders as you're developing these key questions and ask them what they would want to know? In other words, sort of use them to help you develop those key evaluation questions. Does that make sense? Absolutely. And I think it's really a dialogue that happens between the evaluator and stakeholders because sometimes the stakeholders um, will zoom into those things of what can we count, what can we measure, and they think evaluation, they're going to, we're going to count something. And it might take a little bit of education and conversation to bring it up a level. But you definitely want to tailor an evaluation to make sure it serves the information needs of the stakeholders. So those decision makers, the people who are leading the project, the people who are partners, those who are hosting the project at their institution, it pr should provide them with relevant information to help them make decisions about how to improve that project as it's being implemented and make decisions about is this, is this something worth sustaining, expanding, should we modify and so forth. So that's definitely a, um, a key uh, activity. Sometimes you don't have the luxury of that at the proposal stage. Like people don't even know this is going on. Hard to pull people together for a meeting. When that's the case, the evaluator brings their expertise to bear sure. on it. And you'll always have the opportunity to, um, or you should have later on to engage with people if you need to tailor those questions and maybe expand the set. I'm going to do just two more questions for this break. The first one is, can you possibly do all what you just said without burning up three or four pages of the evaluation, you know, of the narrative? Can you fit all of these things into that, let's say, two pages? Can you do it? You definitely can. And we actually want to get a little bit further. I'm going to show you a tool we have to help you with that. But I think right now we probably shouldn't to move on. Yeah. I've probably been a okay, little cool. Thanks. windy Thanks. in my answers. Sorry. So next thing is communication and use. So here you should identify what reports will be prepared and who will receive them. It's good to mention how frequently the evaluator will communicate with the project team. Really want to show there's a feedback loop and also note how the evaluation results will be shared with external audiences. These things are important because the ATE program has some merit review criteria um, in addition to the general ones for all of NSF. And these are about the use and the dissemination of information from the evaluation. Just some key points. So reporting should occur at least annually, but the project team really should be engaging with the evaluator on a regular basis. I talk to my external evaluator every two weeks, for example. And you want to show commitment to using the evaluation results for improvement. Mike, in the interest of time and uh, logistics, I'm going to skip over this example, a uh, little example we were going to do. But if you guys want to do this on your own and follow up with me through email, that is fine. It's in the slides. But I'm going to go ahead and go on to timeline. You do need to identify when key evaluation activities will take place and show there's a concrete plan for getting timely information from the evaluation. Now, by key activities, I mean things like major data collection events, reporting, uh, meetings between the evaluator and the project team or other stakeholders. You can include this timeline in the evaluation section or within the overall timeline for the project. Uh, if you do include it, embed it in an overall project timeline, I would reference that within the evaluation section so that reviewers know it's been addressed. 
So these are the five essential elements you need to include in your ATE evaluation plan. And what that tool I mentioned is this template. So I've actually created um, this little guide. So it has all the elements we've discussed in, that are in the checklist, but I've just put it in like sort of paragraph form so you can see how it would go. And I know this can be done because, like as I mentioned, we just submitted a proposal a while ago and it just got funded. And it was a very large and complex project. Um, and we were able to succinctly communicate our evaluation plan in two pages and, you know, got comments back from the reviewers that it was a sound plan. So it's definitely possible. You need to be very efficient. That's not a time for, you know, lots of extra words and unnecessary description. Just get to the point. Okay, so let's have another quick question break before. Just so I want to make sure we capture anything uh, before we move on to the other parts of your proposal where evaluation needs to show up. Lori, speaking of data, who collects it? Is it the project or the evaluator? It can be a combination. So lots of times the project staff are the one closer on the ground, closer to the participants. And if like there's regular data collection, they can facilitate that process. Sometimes it's very important for the external evaluator to do it because of issues like with regard to anonymity and privacy and it, there needs to be a little more distance. Um, so we definitely like this webinar, we're going to run a survey at the end and I hope everyone sticks around to do it. And that's us collecting the data, but our evaluator, engages in other activities where she's the one who's going to initiate data collection. So it's really, it's, it can be both and probably usually is best done in a comp complementary way. That makes sense. If you had to say, is there a balance between, let's say, the quantitative information that you want to get and the qualitative? How do you balance those two? Well, it's really about the questions you want to answer. And I, so I can't give a hard and fast rule again, but um, you know, if your questions are more about um, how a student or another participant experiences something, then that might be best done through interviews or focus groups or um, e even diary methods. Um, if you need more uh, questions about, you know, how did this impact, uh, um, enrollment or graduation rates and then that of course lends itself to more quantitative so there's no it's really about the questions you want answered and what types of data best address those questions okay that makes sense why don't you go ahead we'll have another question break at the very end definitely all right so up to now we've looked at what goes in this section of your proposal titled evaluation plan now to wrap up, we're going to address the other areas of your proposal where evaluation needs to show up. And this part's a lot shorter, so we're just going to have one final question break at the end. So there are four places where information related to your evaluation should show up and outside of the project description. And the first is called results, results from prior NSF support. And that's relevant only if you've had prior NSF funding. And then there's the budget and budget justification the data management plan, and the references. So if the PI or co-PI in the proposal has received prior funding from NSF related to the current proposal within the past five years, the ATE project description has to begin with a section called results from prior NSF support. So if that applies to your proposal, that's where you would describe the previous project's outcomes and achievements. So reviewers are going to be looking for evidence of the quality and the effectiveness of the prior work that relates to the current proposal. And this section has to include the headings of intellectual merit and broader impacts. That's the NSF review criteria. And you should know that intellectual merit is defined by NSF as the advancement of knowledge and broader impacts are those benefits to society. So we have another little exercise for you. These are statements that could show up in a results of prior support section. So take just a moment to read these on your own, fix your answer in your mind, and then that poll will come up to, and we'll be asking you, which one do you think would be most compelling to reviewers as evidence of the prior out, the outcomes of prior work? I'm sorry, we can't get those polls to show right up on that screen. So you have to finish reading. And then let's go ahead and put up the poll, Mike. 
people are answering in the chat. A lot of people are picking C in the chat and C in the uh, the poll as well. Okay, I think that's good, Mike. You can clear that out, and we can go back to the text on the screen. So, right, Proposal A was really just a statement of what the project was funded to do. There's no information about what was actually accomplished. And surprisingly, this apparently is something that people do a lot. This is according to NSF program um, officers have told me this, that people just paste what they put in their last proposal and put it in this section. Definitely do not do that. With Proposal B, yeah, it's good evidence of productivity, which is great, but we still don't know what changes were occurred because of these activities. So it's okay to include information like this, but reviewers no, 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 want to know what happened as a result of that. And, you know, C has kind of every, both things we're looking for. It has a, what the project did and how many students it served, but it also com comments on what changed for those students because of their engagement with the project. We do have a one-page checklist to help you prepare your results of prior support sections, um, so you can get that uh, from our resources page or the checklist. Even if you don't have uh, to do this in your proposal, it's a good idea to have this on your radar to help you set yourself up for getting this kind of information. On to the budget and budget justification. You may recall this section of the quote from the NSF solicitation about needing an independent evaluator and that the the rest of the quote is that the funds uh, must match the scope of the proposed activities. As we mentioned the rule of thumb is to spend about 10 percent of the project's budget on evaluation. In the ATE program the average expenditure is 7 percent. There really is no magic number or formula. The key is to match the evaluation budget to the scope of the effort. Now something I do want to point out is that um, that you have a couple of options on how this is included in your budget. So the evaluator can be written in as a consultant or a subaward. And again, there's no rule about this, but there's you want to be aware of the differences. If the evaluator is included as a consultant, the cost for the evaluation is written in the consultant section, which details the cost uh, with details about the cost in the budget justification. Now in that justification document, you'll need to specify the evaluator's daily rate, the time committed to the project, and their major tasks and deliverables. It's important to show the details here, not just give lump sums. In subawards, the costs would go in the subawards section of the budget rather than the consultant section, and indirect costs would only be applied uh, to the portion that exceeds 25,000. Did I say that right? I may be wrong on that. Um, it apply indirect costs only to the first 25,000 there. I got it right that time. So you'll save a little bit of money on indirect. So these are things the project would need to do. And then the evaluator would need to provide a separate budget and budget justification and provide a current and pending support form um, for their time commitment. So that, again, there's no rule about this. Check on the institution and the individual's preferences. I know we're closing in on the hour, so next is data management plan. And I'm not going to go through all of these because you really need to uh, look at these requirements in NSF's um, policy and procedures manual. But I do want to point out that you should also, in addition to any data or materials generated by the main project, you need to include evaluation data in your data management plan. And finally is the references cited section, including up-to-date and relevant references to the evaluation literature helps show that your evaluation really is grounded in and building on current knowledge and practice. So you want to make sure if you're using a specific approach or instruments that you're um, mentioning them, citing them, and including them in the references cited. So that leaves a couple minutes for any last questions. Here's a hard one, Lori. Um, you know, all these proposals need a section on sustainability. So does the evaluation ask questions about sustainability? How, how is sustainability related to what the evaluator or evaluation can do? Um, that's a good question. And an evaluation question could focus on um, to what extent is this project 
sustainable or what aspects of this project are more sustainable um, than others. And the, and the ev evaluation can attend to that as it's going on. It's, um, you know, what, what activities are getting more traction than others? Is the institution investing, you know, its part and in, in getting behind the initiative to make it uh, continue beyond project funding? So an evaluation data um, is going to be very illuminating when, it, when you look at um, sustainability, what's more or less sustainable, what needs to be done to enhance sustainability. So it definitely can be integrated into the evaluation. That's perfect. You know, Lori, we are right at the top of the hour. And, and there's a few questions, but some of them are pretty detailed. We might be able to follow up with some of our participants directly by email to, to sort out a couple of those details. And thank you for offering to respond to people uh, via email as well. So we appreciate that. So Lori, I think I'm I'm ready to to wrap up for today. Um, I I'm amazed sitting here thinking about all of that goes into this two uh, this this two pager that's going to be a critical part of your component. But uh, I think reviewers are looking much more closely at evaluation uh, today, and so are funding agencies. So I'm glad you're able to present this information today, folks. Thank you for attending today. This officially ends our webinar. Thank you again. Mm -hmm.